Hi, everyone. I am Stephanie with Nine Health. Let me make sure we are going live and that you can see us. We have an interesting topic to cover today. It's called lifestyle medicine. We all know we should be eating healthy, exercising regularly, managing our stress, getting enough sleep, all those things that are hard to do. We know we should do those things, but there is actually a real benefit to making sure you make those lifestyle changes, do, the, do those positive things in your life. You can really reduce or even prevent some chronic disease, type two diabetes, heart disease, a lot of things. I mean, it's all just good things to do anyway. Um, and it's extra challenging right now, maybe for some of us trapped at home or you know, just getting those good habits in place and those new routines in place. So I'm joined today by Dr. Michelle Tollison. She is an associate professor of lifestyle medicine at Metropolitan State University and also Nine Health expert, Dr. Powell Coley. We've talked to Dr. Tollison several times. We talked to her about lifestyle medicine. She's a breast cancer survivor and shared that journey with us as well. We'll talk to her a little bit about that and how lifestyle medicine has helped in her recovery. But first, um, and I wanna make sure that you, you feel free to ask your questions as well even specific ones. If you have a specific question for Dr. Tollison or Dr. Coley about any changes you should make to improve any conditions or any anything in your life, go ahead and ask those. We'll get those answered. Um, so first, Dr. Tollison, we talked a little bit about what lifestyle medicine is. I mentioned it's healthy eating, getting enough sleep, exercising, but tell us a little bit more about what it is and how it works. Sure, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so lifestyle medicine is the use of those healthy lifestyle behaviors. So as Stephanie mentioned, um, helpful eating, physical activity, moving more, um, stress resiliency, dealing with stress that's part of all of our lives, um, getting regular sleep, engaging in meaningful connections, and avoiding risky substances, and doing all of that to prevent, treat, and sometimes even reverse chronic diseases that are often related to, to lifestyle. So those are considered to be the pillars of lifestyle medicine. So often we, um, as a physician, so often I meet people who think that their genes are their fate. My grandmother, my dad, my brother had type two diabetes, had hypertension, had coronary artery disease, and so I'm destined to get it too. But really our genes are not our fate. Um, uh, genetics of course plays a role However, our lifestyle choices, just those, those simple things we do every day play a tremendous role in impacting our overall health. And so lifestyle medicine isn't about the latest diet fad or about the latest exercise craze. Really, it's about going back to basics, about eating, eating more whole foods, eating more, eating more fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, it's about moving more. It's about prioritizing sleep and connection. So getting back to those basics and really um, engaging in those, those lifestyle behaviors that help to add years to our life and life to our years. Yeah, and that should be, you know, the motivation you really need, you know, just improving your quality of life, improving your overall health. Again, we're talking about lifestyle medicine today. Um, you can ask us any questions that you have about how to implement changes in your life to improve your health or your, any conditions that you're dealing with. Uh, Dr. Coley, as a cardiologist, what lifestyle habits do you typically tell patients to practice? Any changes that they need to make to improve their heart health? You know, heart disease is the number one killer of men and women, and, and that's unfortunate. But the wonderful thing about it is, is that it's highly preventable and reversible with incorporation of lifestyle medicine. So there are a few key things that you can do, and the American Heart Association calls them lifestyle seven or lifestyle eight. But if you do these things, you can substantially reduce and almost even eliminate your risk of having heart disease. As Dr. Tollefson just said, that's a combination of many different factors. So, you know, the first is get moving activity. So we recommend 30 minutes, at least five days a week of moderate intensity activity. So that means something that's going to make you sweat. Uh, not something that's pushing you so hard that you can't get a word out if you're exercising, but not uh, walking the dogs. That doesn't count as breaking a sweat. So something that gets your heart rate up, whether that's dancing, jogging, swimming, biking, whatever your activity of choice is, you got to do it. You can take the weekends off, but you have to do 30 minutes during the week. The second thing I'd recommend is maintaining a healthy body weight. So our body mass index, which is basically our weight over our height, tells us whether or not for our height, we have the right amount of weight on us. And you really, you wanna be between 20 to 25 for your body mass index for an optimal weight. Then another quick way to sort of think about it is for every foot 
uh, excuse me, every inch over five feet, uh, you add five pounds. So if you're five three, you should be about 115 pounds. Um, this is kind of average for men and women. And if you're five five, you should be about 125 pounds and so on and so forth. So that's another kind of quick way to think about whether or not you have an ideal body weight. So exercising, maintaining an ideal body weight. And then the toxic substances that Dr. Tolleson talked about, you really wanna stay away from those cigarettes because they're toxic um, and not just for cancer, but for heart disease, for all these other things that they can cause. And then alcohol, you really wanna limit your alcohol, drink it in moderation. And then finally, it's what you're eating, your diet. So you wanna obviously limit how much fat you're taking in, how much sugar you're taking in, uh, how much sodium you're taking in to less than 1500 milligrams a day and doing all of those things, believe it or not, they sound simple, they're not easy, but they are simple, can really change the course of your life and prevent that horrible heart attack or horrible stroke from ever happening. Yeah, and for some, you know, hearing this might be enough motivation to make the changes needed to exercise better, more, to eat better, um, get, try and get enough sleep, manage your stress. But Dr. Tolleson, we all know we should be doing these things. So what are some techniques that are used to kind of motivate people to actually actually help them make these changes? Sure. So yes, making these changes that, that seem like they should be so simple. I, if, we, if we ask people what they should do to improve their health, many of them will say, I should eat healthier. I should decrease my stress. I should um, exercise more. Um, but even at, the physician may tell their patient that, but then often they'll come back the next time and say, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make significant changes or even with New Year's resolutions. We know many people intend to make those changes and then and then fall short and physicians included. I struggle and have struggled just as much with those healthy behavior changes as many of my patients. And so I like um, I like using some of the different tips that lifestyle medicine pioneer Dr. Beth Brady's out of Harvard. She has um, what she calls uh, their, a mnemonic paving steps. And so as part of that, she includes investigation about really trying to um, be real mindful or paying attention to, to what, um, to investigate what foods are, what foods help us to feel good. Often they're, they're less processed food or more whole foods, um, investigating what activities do we enjoy. So if we, if we have to drag ourselves to the gym every day, or if we have to engage in a, an activity that we don't like, we're not as likely to continue that behavior. But if we can investigate, what do we enjoy doing? What, and investigating how do we feel after we engage in that behavior? Um, one of her other, other um, pillars she includes along with lifestyle medicine is variety. And so with, um, with healthful eating, when you go to the grocery store, can you try a new spice? Can you try a new um, type of cuisine? Can you try a new vegetable? Try to incorporate a new, a new food that you don't, or try a new grain that you don't usually try um, with movement. Try some different types of movement um, that maybe aren't part of your, isn't part of your regular routine. So investigation, variety. Also attitude, we know that attitude plays um, a large role. And so how can we um, have an attitude where we are, are um, almost going to experiment or investigate with how do we feel after engaging in some of these behaviors? And then also energy. How do we gain energy or natural sources of energy? When we are, eat certain foods, do we feel more energized? How does that make our body feel? When we engage in certain um, physical activity uh, routines, how do we feel? Um, also connecting our behaviors with our purpose. And so, um, so like myself, I, and being a breast cancer survivor as well, I want to be healthy because I want to be able to enjoy being active with my kids and eventually grandkids someday. Um, and so connecting, um, connecting our lifestyle behaviors with our greater purpose is often motivation to be successful with those changes. And then also connecting, um, considering connecting with others who can support us with this journey. So wellness coaching is a field where, um, where there are experts who are trained in assisting people with behavior change. So, right, behavior change is hard. It's hard for me when I'm stressed not to just want to go directly to the ice cream, but rather to, to, um, to eat something that has, that's more health, helpful. And so wellness coaches are trained to ask those questions. They're trained to help us find our solutions because often we know what we need to do, but they can guide us down that path. And then also they can help us to set goals. So SMART goals, S specific, M measurable, A attainable, R realistic, and T time bound, but setting specific goals so that we can continue to move in the direction of enhancing our health. 
Um, wellness coaches are really trained to do that. And so I encourage you to consider partnering with a wellness coach or reaching out to your physician who can connect you with a dietitian or a physical therapist who can maybe help you with putting together an exercise regimen. There are so many experts out there, but really, um, really engaging with that, that interdisciplinary team to support your health and well-being and not beating yourself up. Um, even though these things are simple, it's um, behavior change is hard. And so, so kind of getting that whole team together to support you can, can really be beneficial. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the SMART goals because we've talked about that before. Um, and it is hard sometimes too. I feel like people might be you know, more, more motivated once that something actually happens to them. So it is really hard to get in front of things and try to prevent anything from happening, prevent heart disease, prevent type 2 diabetes, make these changes now, make sure you're living the healthiest life you can now. Nine Health tries to help with that as well. Go to ninehealthfair.org and we can help connect you with, um, with resources as well. Um, that Dr. Tolson was mes me mentioning, you know, nutritionist, um, just even a primary care provider, we can help you find someone if you don't have someone. Um, Dr. Coley, talk about things you've seen with your patients. Can you give any examples about changes someone has made to prevent heart disease or to reverse or improve their heart health? And how do you motivate your patients to make changes? Uh, you know, I think one of the most compelling examples, Stephanie, that I have is not of a patient, but of a colleague. And essentially, this was a person who was the president of the American College of Cardiology. So that's our professional society, large organization of cardiologists. And at the beginning of his presidential term, he, he was overweight, he was out of shape, and he opened his presidential keynote lecture by putting up his cholesterol numbers, his hemoglobin A1C, all of his parameters, showing us just kind of how out of shape he was. And he stood on that stage and made a promise that he was going to change his lifestyle change his diet. So he actually became vegan and make a lot of changes because he says, now that I've assumed this presidency, I actually have to put my money where my mouth is and actually be a role model for everybody else. And it was incredible to see his transformation over the next year. So his presidency was one year and at every meeting he would put up kind of interval changes on, on how he was doing. And, and a year later, he was a whole different person. His numbers looked different. He looked different. He felt incredibly different. And to me, that was the most compelling example because number one, it showed us that lifestyle medicine can change the trajectory of disease. And he, he demonstrated that with hard scientific evidence with the lab values getting better, his blood pressure getting better, everything. And number two, he felt so much better. So it was a transformation literally that happened in front of my eyes. And then number three, I think he set an incredible example for his patients to follow. So I always tell that story to people when I think about the power of lifestyle medicine and how much it can transform, not just your disease, but also your life and your experience and your outlook. And, and you know, when you feel better, your mood is better, your relationships are better. It kind of has a whole bunch of domino downstream effects. So I really try to use that sort of story to motivate patients, because as you said, you know, Envisioning that in the beginning is difficult, but Dr. Tolfson has said some great tips as well to really try to understand what your barriers are so that you can try to remove them. Because just all of us, every single one of us know we shouldn't be doing this, that, and the other, we should be exercising. But why is it that it's so difficult for us to incorporate those changes? Why do those New Year's resolutions end up not coming to fruition? So I think that that's a really helpful way to sort of understand yourself because you know yourself better than anyone else and then set that target you know, in your sights and figure out how you can get from point A to point B and use your resources, your doctors, your dietitians, your wellness coaches, your, your community, your family, and your friends. Yeah, I think the accountability thing helps as well. And you both have touched on this, but just the example you gave, I mean, he had a lot of people watching <laughs> to make sure he's delivered on his promise. So that's, I mean, that's a huge motivator and not, not everyone has you know, that much. <laughs> motivation behind them but even just you know my husband and I try to do something every morning try to work out together so we have that like I know that I need to do it because he's going to do it and he knows he needs to do it because I want to do it kind of thing so whether or not that's even true for each person we think each other wants to do it so we kind of get motivated for each other I guess um, so that's kind of helped us because um, we haven't been going to the gym we just tried to be doing stuff be doing stuff at home um, Dr. Tolson, you're a recent breast cancer survivor. I wanted to have you talk about that a little bit. Um, I mean, you were doing lifestyle medicine before your diagnosis and obviously have been doing some lifestyle changes and habits to help in your recovery. Talk a little bit about how, how your journey has gone and how it could help others going through something similar. Sure, thank you. So real briefly, I, um, I ha was engaged in healthy lifestyle behaviors even before my diagnosis and I didn't have any significant risk factors 
And at age 41, I had a normal mammogram, a 3D, um, what we call Virads 1, which is like an A plus. They didn't see anything suspicious. One year and one week later, I went in for a routine screening mammogram and found a two centimeter mass against my chest wall and had invasive ductal carcinoma. And so I had a bilateral mastectomy and went through 16 rounds of chemo, finished on Valentine's Day. But for, for me, I like to share my story because um, being an ob gyne I've seen patients who say, well, I don't have a strong family history or, oh, I don't feel a lump. I didn't feel that lump either. In fact, when I was waiting to have the lump biopsied, I said, can I try to feel that lump to see if I can feel I've done clinical breast exams, but it was hiding against my chest wall and behind my nipple. So even if you can't feel a lump, even if you have no symptoms, even if you have no family history, even if you're engaging in a healthy lifestyle, there still is that risk. And that's why I am an advocate for, for mammograms, for, for screening and everything that Nine Health advocates for. But when I was, um, when I was actually waiting there for, for um, the pathology report and, and the biopsy and everything, I knew that it looked like it was, was almost certainly cancer. And so I started to think, why me? But then I thought, why not me? One in eight women will get breast cancer at this diagnosis during their lifetime. And so initially, um, as my colleagues and, and the amazing team, everyone kept saying, I'm so sorry. And I thought I need to, in order to help myself move through this journey and be a survivor, I need to embrace lifestyle medicine now more than ever before. So I bought some um, bright pink new tennis shoes and, um, and started looking, at, even though I, I was eating healthy, I, I made an appointment with the dietitian at the UC Health um, they have a cancer wellness center. And so I used all of their resources. I made the appointment with my oncologist and I walked right over and said, what is this wellness center? Because I need to embrace all the healthful activities that I can. So I met with their physical therapists who are amazing and um, exercised every day, I believe during chemo, even though it wasn't my typical exercise. And sometimes it was just doing a real, real minimum uh, amount of movement, but I embraced that. It actually extra has been shown to help with um, some types of cancer related fatigue. And so the physical therapist can be guides with that. I um, was struggling with stress and with sleep with that diagnosis. How do I, how do I tell my kids about it? How do I, how do I continue to work? Um, what does that look like, my roles? And so I met with a, a therapist that was at the cancer center as well. And so for me, having that interdisciplinary team that was um, helping me to eat healthily during cancer, active cancer treatment and beyond, to exercise, to move, to manage my stress and my sleep. And also I had my, my infusion center for chemotherapy there. My oncologist was there. So the, really that interdisciplinary team really helped me. And even though, even if you haven't had a cancer diagnosis, I think we've all had those, those teachable moments, right? Is it a heart attack? Is it, um, is it some, a, a loved one getting sick? We all have those teachable moments, or maybe it's having a new, um, getting pregnant or having, having a new baby. What is that teachable moment? And can we use that diagnosis? Can we use that, um, that information or that time of transformation? For many women who I see, it's going through menopause. Can we use that in order to be a teachable moment or a teachable transition where we really are reflective on our own habits, not with shame, blame, and guilt, but just checking in to say, are there things that I'm doing that I would like to do differently? One of the first books I often recommend for patients is Undo It by um, Dean Ornish, who's been a leader in lifestyle medicine for years, or Dr. Beth Frady's Lifestyle Medicine Handbook. Um, but they really provide that, that basic framework, but then really bringing in that interdisciplinary team and working with a team to help with behavior change. Um, for me, those were all instrumental in helping me get through breast cancer. And I'd like to say I'm, I'm not just a breast cancer survivor. Um, that sounds like I'm just barely getting by. I'm, I try my best to be a thriver to, to walk the walk and not that it's, um, that it's easy. I mean, there are definitely times where, where it is hard to kind of practice what I preach, um, but I, I am kind and gentle with myself and try to do the best I can each day. Remember my greater purpose in um, engaging in those healthy behaviors that it's, it's for myself, it's for my family, for those who I'm connected with and for myself and to continue to share the lifestyle medicine message with others. I thank you for sharing your story again. It's so well said that we just need to all do the best we can. And I will now refer to you as a breast cancer thriver. I like that. 
<laughs> I like that a lot. That's an awesome way to say it. Cause you are, you seem like you're doing great and you look great. And again, just thank you for sharing your story with others. We haven't gotten any questions on Facebook. If you have questions, even specific ones, if you're battling a condition or you just want to prevent something, um, you can still post that in the comments when we sign off here and I can pass those questions along to these lovely ladies and they will provide those expert answers needed. Um, before we sign off here and before we go, I do want to remind everyone that Colorado Gives Day is coming up. So Nine Health is a separate nonprofit and we um, we are able to do what we get, we are able to do what we do thanks to contributions from the community. So Colorado Gives Day, December 8th. I'll put the link in the comments. You can schedule a donation anytime just to support the work that Nine Health does as far as providing affordable health screenings, providing health education like what we're providing to today. And if you missed the Nine Health Fairs this fall, we weren't able to hold them in the spring because of COVID, um, but in the fall, we had a handful of fairs um, to get those affordable screenings, but you can get them now anytime at Quest Diagnostics Patient Service Centers. I'll put the link in the comments for that as well, um, but go to ninehealthfair.org right now if you want for details on that, but you can get you know your $35 blood chemistry panel anytime you want now at Quest Diagnostics. Get your baseline of health, find out what lifestyle changes you need to make to improve if you need to improve. Um, and if you have a health question or if you need help finding, you know, we talked about nutritionists, we talked about dietitians, we talked about connecting with a health team. If you need help finding any resources like that, call our Nine Health Neighbors line. It's 303-698-4455, extension 2005. I'll also put that in the comments for you. You leave a message and a Nine Health medical volunteer calls you back. You can talk to a real person um, with any questions you have, mental health, physical health, whatever you're, you're thinking about and you want questions answered, you can call us and, and get those. I wanna thank you ladies for joining us and providing your expertise. Hopefully everyone got some good information today. I think they did and we'll sign off from here. Thanks so much. Thank you.